Welcome to the lecture on stochastic frontier analysis. We will be looking at several topics in here. First is why do we need production function frontiers as opposed to having just something else like an average production function. Then we will define what stochastic frontiers are or what SFA is, stochastic frontier analysis. We will look at the different inefficiency types, half normal, exponential, and so on. Then we'll discuss briefly how you estimate stochastic frontiers and how do you get in inefficiency estimates from your estimated models and what do you do when you have not a production function but some other kind of frontier which you can have for example a cost frontier a profit function frontier and so on until the late 1960s most production function analysis was based on the normal production function or what uh, we will call for the sake of uh, clarity an average production function so there was no allowance for inefficiency so when you wanted to estimate a production function you just specified what that function was and then estimated the function and there was just a normal error as in ordinary least squares which was symmetric and uh, could be both positive and negative and was capturing noise and measurement errors so if you have data on inputs and outputs and you estimate a function the function went through the cloud of data that's why we call it an average production function because it wasn't enveloping your data in any form. Later on, in the late 1960s, there was the idea of the frontier production function. It was recognized that observed data points are not necessarily efficient and it's useful to account for inefficiency in the estimation of production functions. So inefficiency had to be added into the model. So the idea of a frontier was implemented in the late 60s, for example, by Eigner and Chu, who came up with a production function that enveloped all the data. We could think of the production function going over or above the data, unlike the average production function. So all the data points were either efficient or inefficient, uh, depending on whether they were on the curve or below. Now, currently, we don't do that. The most popular approach that we use is not a deterministic frontier we instead use a stochastic frontier and this stochastic frontier isn't uh, uh, like the deterministic frontier which basically would have for example if you had a quadratic function the deterministic frontier would be something like this and you could think of um, some error u but this was inefficiency what this didn't have compared to the average production function was a symmetric error term which allowed you to capture noise and measurement errors. So the stochastic frontier was addressing this shortcoming. The fact that the deterministic frontier was good because it was recognizing inefficiency, but it wasn't good because it was ignoring the um, standard noise term. So the stochastic frontier has a composite error. And this composite error means we have something that accounts for inefficiency and also for noise and that's why we call it a composite error. This was first uh, introduced by Agner, Laval and Schmidt who uh, came up with the idea in 1977 but there was simultaneously a same idea being introduced by others uh, same year and that's how the SFA was born. The two approaches, the deterministic one and the stochastic frontier one, differ not just in how they incorporate errors or what errors they incorporate, but also how they are estimated. The deterministic one can be estimated using mathematical programming, like uh, linear programming or some other nonlinear programming method, whereas the stochastic frontier requires estimation by econometric means, such as uh, maximum likelihood estimation. So, what we have just said is the key difference between the two frontiers, the deterministic and stochastic, is that one frontier includes noise, the other one doesn't, and that's the deterministic one, which doesn't include noise, so all deviations from the frontier are attributed to inefficiency. So there is no other interpretation of deviations from the frontier, it's all inefficiency. So this is similar to what we have in data envelopment analysis, where all deviations from the frontier are considered to be inefficiency.
With the stochastic frontier, on the other hand, the deviations from the frontier has two components. As I said uh, earlier, noise, which I had as written as E, but is typically written as V, and inefficiency, which is typically written using the uh, letter U. So how does the stochastic frontier model look? Well, if it's going to not attribute all deviations from the frontier to inefficiency, that means it's allowing for noise. So when you have a production function, there is the function, which could be, for example, quadratic, but then you have the noise term and the inefficiency term. And what that means is, relative to the curve, the deviations from the curve that you estimate, which could be any function, the deviations are not just because of inefficiency, but because of noise as well. So if we look at this form, for example, the production function is in log form. So we have f of x here. Now, the deviations from that frontier have two components. One is v and the other one is u. So what that means is the inefficiency component will pull down output, but the noise term, which could be both positive and negative, it could set the maximum possible output level below or above f of x. So in this case, for example, if we look at this curve, that's our f of x, let's say, then we have a noise term and that's going to give us the maximum possible output. And then the actual output will be that less u. So what's happening at point A? Well, point A is below the the curve but we also know that the contribution of the noise term va is positive that's why that point is above the curve but if we look at point b now the contribution of the noise term is negative so the maximum possible output is below the curve and then we have to look at what the actual outputs are in the case of b and a of course because inefficiency pulls down the output level then what we have here is the contribution of inefficiency pulling down the, uh, the output level from the start point here to the actual one here and in here it's doing the same thing that's the contribution of the inefficiency so what we are looking at here is when we look at the maximum possible output we have to look at the curve which is the equation and also the contribution of the noise term and because of this the frontier isn't a fixed frontier it's a stochastic frontier so the stochastic term in the stochastic frontier comes from that very fact where we have to look at not f of x but also the stochastic element v to know what's possible for a maximum output and then the inefficiency will give us the actual output if we have a function like that and we have a composite error which is just the two terms together then our efficiency level or technical efficiency level is observed output over maximum possible output but maximum possible output is given by that portion which is the portion shown here and of course if we take the ratio of these two we get the actual output over maximum possible output as our technical efficiency now that's if y is in natural units. If y is in log form, then what we have is actually these error terms are in the form of log values. So if we think in terms of natural units, what we have is the inefficiency is actually e to the power of minus u and the stochastic element is scaling up the output predicted by the curve by e to the power of v. So what this all means is if we take actual output over maximum output, then what we find is that it's e over e to the power of minus u, and that's our technical efficiency. So if you estimate a log form, that's what you do, for example, with a translog, or if you estimate a copter glass after a log transformation. So typically, V, the noise term, is meant to be normally distributed with a mean of zero and a variance of sigma V. When it comes to the inefficiency term, which is asymmetric because it has to always be positive, one of the most common assumptions about its form is the half normal. So under the half normal assumption, what we are saying is 
Well, U comes from normal distribution that has a zero mean, but it's coming only from the positive side of that. So if that's our normal distribution has a zero mean, and if you look at the distribution of that, it might look like something like this. It's a yeah, half normal distribution. That's one of the most common ones. Another one is to um, think that it comes from a truncated normal distribution. So in this case, what we have is we have a distribution at the source of ui, but the mean is not zero. So mu could, for example, be two. And if that's the case, since ui has to be positive and if zero is here, then ui is coming from this portion of the distribution. You could also have a distribution, a truncated distribution story where mu is actually negative, let's say negative two. And if that's the case, uh, since u has to be always non-negative, then it's going to come from this portion. So that's a truncated normal distribution. And the way it's written in papers, you will see it written this way. So it's coming from a distribution with a mean that's not necessarily zero. Okay, so we have looked at two of the basic ones. These are normal distributions, half normal and truncated normal. Another common one is a exponential distribution. So the exponential distribution, you have a distribution that looks like this. Again, this always gives you a positive value for UI. It looks like something like this, but can be very close to the um, normal distributions in, in form. A more flexible one tried is a gamma distribution. This distribution is more general and also harder to estimate other than by simulated maximum likelihood methods, but it can look like many different forms depending on the parameters theta and beta. A special case of uh, the gamma, for example, is exponential distribution where one of the parameters is set to one and you get the exponential, so it's uh, more general. So we have described the stochastic frontier model where we have a production function that has a noise term and an inefficiency term. And we have said that this inefficiency term could be half normal, could be truncated normal, could be exponential, or could be gamma distributed. So that's what we have done, whereas the noise term is always normal with zero mean in standard deviation. So how do we estimate this? function that has two error terms. How does it differ from the average production function that we can estimate just with a normal error term? Well, the first thing to look at um, in this case is the fact that they differ only by the presence of this error, otherwise they have the same structure. And in terms of estimation, it has been shown that ordinary least squares or OLS can generate slope estimates that are consistent. So with a large sample size, the estimate would converge on the true but unknown slope coefficient. So if you estimated just an OLS model, a production function, the slope terms would be fine, but the intercept would be biased because we have two functions. One is something that's supposed to go through the cloud, the average production function. The other one is a stochastic frontier. It touches the cloud, but it tends to be on the upper portion of the cloud. So the intercept term uh, would be something you would expect to be biased if you ignore the fact that you have a minus u term or that the data have inefficiency. So corrected OLS or calls is a method that uses OLS but then rectifies the bias in the intercept uh, using a simple method and that simple method is to adjust it. So Basically, OLS is being used to estimate the stochastic frontier in this uh, case. Of course, you could also recognize the fact that you have a composite error term with two components. This is what they call skew normal. It's going to be skewed to one side. Then you could look at the maximum likelihood function, which is given here. And you could maximize this to estimate the parameters. So MLE or maximum likelihood is another method, which is the standard method now used to estimate stochastic frontiers. So in this case, the way it's written, uh, you would know what the parameters are, but it's important to recognize that uh, sigma here, sigma square is the 
variance of the composite error E, and that's the sum of the variance of the noise term and the variance of the inefficiency term. Because they are independent, then the variance of their sum or difference is going to be the sum of their variances. Another term that you will see here in the likelihood is uh, the term lambda that you see here. And lambda is the ratio of the standard deviation of the inefficiency term to the standard deviation of the noise term. So it shows you how important inefficiency is relative to noise. And if you maximize this log likelihood function with respect to the parameters of the model, so that would be the betas and also sigma or sigma square and lambda you will be able to estimate it so since sigma square here is the sum of the variances of the two errors and lambda is the ratio of the standard deviation so once you get lambda then you can recover the uh, variance terms for the two error terms um, so you'll be able to estimate all the parameters that matter. This is how you um, specify the model for maximum likelihood. Of course, if you have an exponential distribution, uh, unlike the half normal, which this one is for, you will get a slightly different form. And if you have a truncated normal, it will also be different. And if you have a gamma, of course, it would be different. But the gamma one will need simulated maximum likelihood. So in the previous one, we had a case where we had lambda being used in the likelihood function, but Batiz and Cora had another idea, and their idea was to not use this parameterization, but to use something called gamma. And gamma is the ratio of the variance of the inefficiency term to the variance of the composite error term. Gamma being something that's bound between zero and one, is important because when you are doing maximum likelihood method and you are looking for parameter values that optimize the function then you could limit your search to between 0 and 1. When you have the other parameterization on the other hand where you are using lambda well the value of lambda can be anything between 0 and infinity so that's a bit difficult to search for but if you know gamma you would also know what lambda is because they are relative. If you know lambda, you can recover gamma as well. So no information is left, but sometimes causes problems because some software reports lambda, some report gamma, and of course there are standard errors that come with estimation. And then if you combine results obtained using different software, it might look a bit odd because you would have to do some work to generate the standard errors or you are going to have one of them reported for one model and the other one for a different model and this is quite common when the models are advanced uh, as we'll see later and some software fails and you have to keep going by using some other software so if we use maximum likelihood methods to estimate the stochastic frontier model uh, obviously we'll estimate the beta values which means we can then think of our function and that function i am being a bit lazy here is that one so once we have the curve estimated then we can know what the composite error term is so that composite error term is zero it's easy to calculate but how do we split it into inefficiency and noise in particular we are interested in the inefficiency so how do we find our estimates for ui well there has been a result since the early 80s called the john bro method and what it does is it helps you estimate the value for ui or the inefficiency based on the values you have already for uh, sigma and uh, the composite error and so on so it has a specific formula the expected value of ui given your output level for that observation yi is given by what you see on this side but what do you have on the right hand side well we have to look at the next slide to know what they are so ui star is the negative of the composite error times the ratio of the inefficiency variance to the total variance that's one and sigma square star is this ratio between the product of the two error variances that is sigma v square and sigma u square and the composite error variance so 
all of this you can calculate once you have estimated your model but the standard software will um, do this for you so you don't need to do that because it automatically gives you estimates of the efficiency levels there was another suggestion by Batis and Coley on what the best way to estimate technical efficiency was if you have uh, in your model the log of y like a translog or something and uh, that is you look not for the expected value of u given yi you should work for the estimated value of e to the power of ui that should be expected value of e to the power of ui given yi because that's your inefficiency term not this u term so if you do that then you end up with this slightly different form and again that requires a uh, calculation of some uh, numbers like the sigma square two star and ui star and so on so we have seen how to estimate a an sfa it has got two errors you can estimate it using mle or some other method and then you can calculate in efficiency terms or efficiency levels so that's for production functions what happens if we have some other frontier like a cost frontier well in the case of cost we can use the same structure except our non-negative inefficiency term has to be added rather than subtracted from the rest of the equation because when we have inefficiency in the case of cost what happens is efficiency means we end up spending more not less than is required or the minimum required so because of this the u term should be added rather than sub subtracted so that's cost frontier of course if we have some other dual form like uh, profit efficiency then it would be just like the production function where inefficiency means we generate profits less than what we would otherwise so the ui term has to be subtracted for profit functions there are other forms that are not dual but uh, such as input and output distance functions we'll cover this later in the um, in the course but in these cases again we will have we can formulate stochastic frontiers and these are obtained by using their linear homogeneity properties to transform them into sfa type models we can also have directional distance functions and again these ones can be translated into usable form for stochastic frontier analysis using their equivalent property called translation property and this is shown for example in Hilo and Chambers they are work on, on uh, soil quality indicators in a paper published in JPA so we have covered the basic SFA model it's going to be either a cost function a profit function or production function and it's going to give us some function of things and beta and then there is going to be a noise term and an inefficiency term that gets added or subtracted depending on whether we have cost or profit and production functions but there can be other variations to the model so we could for example have models that help us explain the mean and variance or both of the efficiency term what that means is instead of having u for example being distributed with a mean mu and a variance sigma u pair we could have a model that makes a mu for example here a function of uh, variables called z variables typically called uh, an efficiency model we could have that and that means we could explain the effect of z variables like age could be education could be other things on inefficiency level so that's one but you can have the same thing with uh, the variance so we could have the variance sigma u square and now this would be for uh, observation i let's say being a function it has to be exponentiated because we want the variance to always be positive and exponentiation ensures that it is so these are just two uh, simple ways of extending the model and if we have panel data then we could of course estimate uh, other types of models such as fixed effects random effects so when we are working with 
panel data, then we will have the issue of distinguishing between heterogeneity and inefficiency or efficiency because it might become difficult and there are models that ignore one and focus on the other or try to recognize both. We'll see those later. But if you want to read more on these things, there is some good literature, Green 2008, a book chapter in the um, collection book on efficiency and productivity measurement is good. And also you could look at uh, a paper by Kumbakar and Jonas uh, and there are others by Kumbakar as well. So there is plenty of stuff to read on stochastic frontiers uh, in terms of either standard ones or panel data, as we'll see later. Okay, here is a list of some of them. And this is a good starting point.